Happy Sabbath and good evening. We have enjoyed the morning program and the youth service this afternoon with all the music and the different presentations. And now we're ready for one more presentation for today. I'd like to greet our friends that are watching online as well as those that are currently watching in a local church. Now this presentation is entitled Transformed Hearts, Transformed Homes and will be presented by Peter Lausevich. Peter Lausevich is the Regional Secretary for North America. And before we watch this service, I would like to ask you to bow down in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we'd like to thank you so much, Lord, for all the possibilities you are giving us to watch online or to be present in the local church. And Lord, as uh, we are preparing our hearts for this service, we ask that you may send us the Holy Spirit, that uh, our hearts may be opened and our minds may be clear, that we may understand the message that you want to give us today. We ask that you may bless the lips of the speaker so that any word that he will pronounce will be coming from you and not from himself. And we ask and pray, and we ask for blessings over those that are watching. In the name of Jesus, amen.
I'm very happy to be participating in this conference together with you in Canada. I know we plan to be there personally, and I wanted to spend a little time with you all there, but unfortunately we can't travel to Canada, so I thank the Lord that we have this opportunity via this type of media to be able to communicate together with you and share the message that the Lord has upon our hearts. At this time, before we begin, we do want to ask the Lord's blessing, and so I'd like to invite those who are able to, to kneel with me, to have a word of prayer. Our gracious, loving Father in heaven, we're so thankful to you for your so many wonderful blessings. Even we cannot fellowship together in person, we ask your Holy Spirit may be with us today as we open your word, and we ask your Holy Spirit may work upon events in society so that we can fellowship once again with each other and to encourage each other on the way to the kingdom of heaven. Be with those especially who are yet in the valley of decision that something that they may hear may touch their hearts, they may surrender their life fully to you and walk with you. Bless us, we pray and thank you in the worthy name of Jesus our Savior, amen. Whenever we think about Jesus, we think about the promise that he made that he is going to come again the second time. In Acts chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven." I know during this conference we've been studying about the work of Elijah, but we cannot separate the work of Elijah from the thought that Jesus is coming back again the second time. In Luke chapter 1, verse 17, it says, And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So when we are talking about, in this case, the first coming of Christ, but also the second coming of Christ, we know that there has to be a work of preparation. And this work of preparation is to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. And so today we're going to be studying about what that actually means in a practical way. We are familiar with the command in Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6 that all parents understand. It says there, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. This actually is a promise that God has given us, that if we train up a child in the way he should go, when he gets older, he is not going to depart from that way. You see, when we're talking about having children, the main purpose of having children is not just to have some sociability, not to have someone take care of us when we get older, not someone that we just put our energies into. And all of that is very good to educate and train, but we're talking about educating and training for eternity. And this is why in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 18, it says, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me, etc. So we find here that the main purpose for having children is to prepare them for eternal life. And this is what we should constantly keep in view when we're talking about training our children. In Child Guidance, page 38, it says, to parents is committed the great work of educating and training their children for the future immortal life. Many fathers and mothers seem to think that if they feed and clothe their little ones and educate them according to the standard of the world, they have done their duty. But that's not our only duty. 
is to help them get situated in this world. It is important to get them situated in this world. Don't misunderstand me. It's important to make sure that they have a good education so they can be useful members in society. But we need to remember that the main purpose is to prepare them for eternal life. As we look at some of our forefathers, especially Abraham, why was he chosen to be the leader of God's people? It says in Genesis 18, verse 19, For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him. This is why Abraham was chosen as a leader of God's people. And so, we find here that in, um, in Child Guidance, continuing on in page 38, that this education process of Abraham is not limited only to that period of time in which the children were growing up. It says here, they are too much occupied with business or pleasure to make the education of their children the study of their lives. I want you to think about this a little bit. It's not just for a short period of time and say, my work is done. Even when your children get out of the home and they establish homes of their own, our responsibility for our children does not end. We actually have to spend our lives trying to find ways to help our children. I know one father who was constantly trying to study ways to help his child who has gone astray. And that child, he kept praying for him. He kept working with him and everything else to no avail. Finally, he got sick and he died. And it was at his funeral that his son finally accepted the gospel call. He understood what his father's life was all about. So that father did not see his son's conversion during his life, but he spent his entire life. So let me read this again. They are too much occupied with business or pleasure to make the education of their children the study of their lives. They do not seek to train them so that they will employ their talents for the honor of their Redeemer. Solomon did not say, tell a child the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. But train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. It's really important for us to train children. Now, what does that mean? What are we actually to be teaching? Deuteronomy 6 verse 5 says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. So we are teaching them to love God, to love Him with all our heart. Now, in order to be successful in teaching our children to love the Lord with all the heart, what has to happen with us? Notice in Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 29, as God is looking at the children of Israel, He had just given them the Ten Commandments, or written in, Mo in the case of Moses, uh, writing them down again this time here at the end of the wilderness wanderings. And what does He say? He says there in verse 29, Oh, that there were such an heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Oh, if there were such an heart in them. Yes, um, God wanted that the parents themselves would have a heart not just to teach something to someone else, but to experience it personally in their own lives. In volume 3, page 131, it says this language is positive. The training which Solomon enjoins is to direct, educate, and develop. In order for parents and teachers to do this work, they must themselves understand the way the child should go. So before we can teach, we must understand what God wants of us. And then it needs to be in our heart. And then we are to share it with our children. 
Now, one of the most important things when we're talking about education and training is that God wants us to use our reasoning powers. Reasoning is not the easiest to deal with. It's much easier to teach it like an animal. You know, you, you spank, you do all these things, and what happens? The person obeys implicitly for fear, not because they have it in their mind. And so God does not want us to beat the child into submission. What God wants us to do is train up a child. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, it shows clearly what this reason, this training involves. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. And so God is using reasoning powers in us. He wants us to be able to reason with our children, to help them understand why they are to do this. And yeah, sometimes they take the wrong direction. They go in a different direction that you want them to, but you still try to work with them and reason with them so that they can understand the reason why God wants them to do something. Again, in Child Guidance 223, the object of discipline is the training of the child for self-government. He should be taught self-reliance and self-control. Therefore, as soon as he is capable of understanding, his reason should be enlisted on the side of obedience. So as soon as a child is able to understand something, they need to be taught to get their conscience on the side of obedience. It goes on. Let all dealing with him be such as to show obedience to be just and reasonable. Help him to see that all things are under law and that disobedience leads in the end to disaster and suffering. So what God wants us to do is to educate our children to understand that God's requirements are just and reasonable and that it makes sense. When someone you are studying with, uh, giving them a Bible study, and this is whether it's anybody else or even your own children, when they come to the point of understanding God's principle and says, well, that seems reasonable to me, then you are getting somewhere. Their reason is being used. And why is it that a child has reasoning abilities. Why is it that we need to reason with them? What's the main purpose for that? In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. So what we find here is that human beings are made in the image of God. Men and women are all created in the image of God. And God has the capacity to think. And since we are made in His image, then those children of ours, they also have the capacity to think. In the book Education, page 17, it says every human being created in the image of God is endowed with a power akin to that of the Creator, individuality, power to think and to do. The men in whom this power is developed are the men who bear responsibilities, who are leaders in enterprise, and who influence character. So what we find here is that what God wants us to do is to replicate that in, the, uh, in our children. The same thing that God has, the power to think, that's what he wants us to do. And so the purpose of education is not simply to get our children to obey, but the purpose of education is to get our children to think. We continue on here. It says, it is the work of true education to develop this power, 
to train the youth to be thinkers, not merely reflectors of other men's thoughts. You see, that's the whole purpose of education. It's not just to make them to repeat things. It's not make them just simply to obey. But what we want them to do is that they are thinkers and that they do things because they thought it through. Those are the type of children that become leaders in society and in the church. They think for themselves. And that's the purpose of true education. And that may take a little bit longer time. So when we're thinking about preparing a people for the second coming of Christ, when we're talking about turning the hearts of the fathers to the children, we're talking here, first of all, that fathers have an experience with God and then to be able to transmit it to their children, not just in understanding, but helping them to think for themselves. When we're thinking about this type of education, what type of education is it? We continue in educa book education. Such an education provides more than mental discipline. It provides more than physical training. It strengthens the character so that truth and uprightness are not sacrificed to selfish desire or worldly ambition. It fortifies the mind against evil. In other words, when you turn around, the children are still obedient. I've been to many places, both dealing with children and also dealing with uh, in the church. I've been to churches where everybody's in line and we're told, oh, these, these churches here are so obedient, not like the churches where you're coming from. And then I go Saturday night with those same churches and when the minister's not there, they act something completely different. Why is it? Because they have been taught merely to be obedient in the presence of leadership, not when they're absent. You know, we, we want is not only our children, but even our members to be obedient even when we are not there. Why? Because we are not policemen. That's not our job, to be policemen. You know, one time we were taking care of a man and uh, one of the uh, sisters was there to take care of him while we were gone. And he says, look, now they're gone. You can sneak in a few things. She says, what do you mean? Oh, they're gone now. Now you can eat some meat. Now you can do this. Now you can do that. And she says, oh, no, I'm not doing that. He says, why not? They're gone. He says, well, I'm not doing it because they're here. I'm doing it because it's my conviction. And that's how it translates not only in our children, but even in our ministry of teaching people to do things because they are convinced it's the right thing to do, that they are thinkers, not merely reflectors of other men's thoughts. It continues down further. Instead of some master passion becoming a power to destroy... Every motive and desire are brought into conformity to the great principles of right. As the perfection of his character is dwelt upon, the mind is renewed and the soul is recreated in the image of God. That's the purpose of education, to be able to change the way a person thinks, not merely their actions. And you know the worst thing when we're thinking about training and education, whether we're talking about our own children, whether we're talking about in the church capacity, or when we're doing evangelism, what is the worst thing? You find this in Matthew 23, verses 2 and 3 saying the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. See, this is the critical issue here. Hypocrisy is the worst thing. When we are teaching one thing and doing another, that destroys influence. And how many times I've talked to young people in the church and the thing that bothers them so much is that the character displayed in public by parents is not the character that they find at home. And even other people, when you talk about people leaving the church, what's the big problem? This is the issue. 
And this is why in ministry of healing 390 to 391, and what he requires of his children, he himself should practice, illustrating these virtues in his own manly bearing. In other words, what? What we are requiring of others, we ourselves should be practicing. And this is why example is so important. 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. It says here what? That we are to be an example to the believers. Example is so powerful. This is why the world does not need so many more sermons, but the world needs to see Jesus in us, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And this is why the most perfect example is the example of Jesus. 1 Peter chapter 2, 21 and 22. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. It is true that every human being is going to disappoint us. This is why we're taught not to trust in human beings. I remember a statement in Ministry of Healing that says that the Lord in his mercy and faithfulness often permits those in whom we trust to fail us that we may learn the folly of trusting in man and uh, making flesh our arm. That's why it's so important for us to look to Jesus, to have him as our example. In Review and Herald, it says here, that there are few parents who realize how important it is to give to their children the influence of a godly example. Yet this is far more potent than precept. No other means is so effective in training them in right lines. The children and youth must have a true copy in right doing if they succeed in overcoming sin and perfecting a Christian character. This copy they should find in the lives of their parents. Notice here, what do children need? They need to see a copy of what they are hearing. That we as parents are teaching them from the Bible, and then they look at the copy. That's what they should see. They should see it in their parents. It goes on, if they enter the city of God and rejoice in the overcomer's reward, someone must show them the way. By living before their children godly, consistent lives, parents may make the work before them clear and plain. That is the work of parents. That's why it says, turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. Why? Because we must be converted first. We are to show the example to our children. That's the work of Elijah. That's the work of preparation. And once it is in my heart, then I can teach it to my children, then I can teach it to others. And that's what it says in Deuteronomy 6, verse 6 to 9. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gate. Yes, first it must be in our hearts. Then wherever we are, whatever we are doing, we are teaching it to our children. And this is why it is really important for us as a people to be doing something. And what is it that we should be doing? What is it that we should be looking at our children, no matter what age they are? We should be actively working for the conversion of our children. In Review and Herald, April 21st, 1891. 
This is work to be done for those around you. They cannot be neglected. Your children are to be educated in the truth. Parents should talk to their little ones of Jesus and of the plan of salvation. They should weave precious lessons of the life and character of Christ into their children's minds that they may become the followers of Christ and heirs of eternal life. Yeah, this is the work that we need to be doing. And from a very young age, are we sharing the gospel with our children? John the Baptist could understand it even in the womb. Are we training our children for eternal life? You know, there is a mission field. God has told us in Mark 16, verse 15. He says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Yes, this is our work. Our work is to preach the gospel to every creature. But now, what is that first mission field? What is the mission field that we need to be concerned with more than any other? In Review and Herald, again, 1891. There is much talk of foreign missionary work, but the homework is neglected. The greatest mission field is right at our firesides, and the great need is that of fathers and mothers in Israel. When parents begin to realize the great responsibility that rests upon them, they will take upon this home missionary work and train their children for heaven. They will give their little ones line upon line and precept upon precept. So what we need is fathers and mothers in Israel to take care of the children. But now not only our own children. Let's talk a little bit about fathers and mothers in Israel. What happens if we have to separate from our families in order to serve the Lord. And this may happen sometimes. Quite a few people, they decide to serve the Lord and their families leave them. What then? What are they to do? In Psalms 27 verse 10, it says, When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Yes, when our earthly parents forsake us, then God becomes our parent. How is that? Notice the ways that he does that. In Mark chapter 10, verse 29 to 30, God says that he will replicate our families. And Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, there is no man that had left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospel's, but he shall receive an hundredfold. Now in this time, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. So what happens when we experience this? When we lose our father and our mother, and especially when we lose them because they reject the truth. Now sometimes we lose our father and mother because... Unfortunately, in this world, people die. God didn't design us to die. God designed us to live forever. But at the same time, we do have this thing that we do die. We are mortal. So what happens when we lose our father and we lose our mother? Well, God says he becomes our father and our mother. He becomes our family. But he also does something else. He puts us in church capacity. Notice 1 Timothy 5 verse 1. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as a brethren. Notice here we find individuals in the church that become our fathers. So yes, even if we don't have an earthly father that we can confide with, we in the church as elders, we actually need to become fathers to these young people. Are we doing that? Are we acting the part of fathers? Or are we just doing the ritual work of elders? 
You know, there's such a work for us to do in the church, to become fathers to these people. Do we care for their souls? Do we care for what's going on in their life? Are we taking a personal interest in these people? Are we doing that? The greatest lack that we have is fathers and mothers in Israel. That's our lack as a church. And so, yes, mothers, 1 Timothy 5, verse 2, the very next verse. The elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters with all purity. Do we have that in the church? Fathers and mothers in Israel? And it says that it's going to do what? The work of Elijah is to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Are we doing that in the church? Not just thinking of our own homes. The first part of this message was thinking about our home, and that's an important work. But what about our work? Those who are leaders in Israel, are you a father? Are you a mother in Israel? And why is that? You know, we find a case that the whole city was about to be destroyed by Joab, and we find in 2 Samuel 20, verse 19, a woman says, I am one of them that are peaceable and faithful in Israel. Thou seekest to destroy a city and a mother in Israel. Why wilt thou swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? Here was a lady that was a mother in Israel, and yeah, she did save that city. Job, what was Job? What else is there? Notice Job 29, 16. I was a father to the poor, and the cause which I knew not, I searched out. Here's the work in the church. Fathers and mothers to those in the church. Fathers and mothers to those who are poor. Are we concerned for those around us? Now, what type of people are going to be these fathers and mothers in Israel? Is it just anybody? Yes, it goes back to our character, just like in the home. It goes to our character. And notice what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12, verse 47 to 50. Then said one, said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, who is my mother? And who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. We need fathers and mothers in Israel, but they need to have a character of the father and the mother in Israel? Do we have those who are caring for the people within our church? Are we, do we have those who are caring for those even who have gone out of the church? Where are the fathers and mothers in Israel? You know, I think of the case of Moses in Numbers chapter 11, verse 12. And he's talking to God and he says, Have I conceived all this people? Have I begotten them that thou shouldest say unto me, Carry them in thy bosom as a nursing father beareth a sucking child unto the land which thou swearest unto thy fathers? Yes, this is what we need. We need those people like Moses. A lot of people wanted the job of Moses. Yes, a lot of them. They even fought to have the job of Moses. They even died trying to get the job of Moses. But how many of them were nursing fathers like Moses? How many of them had that care? How many of us have the actual care for people as ministers, as elders, as church leaders? And then, of course, within the families, fathers and mothers. How many of us have that care for each other? In volume four, Testing for the Church, why is it that people need to be brought into the church? Why is it that people need to join the church, not just be baptized, but added into the church daily, such as should be saved in uh, Acts chapter two? Why is it? Notice this in volume four, page 69. Preaching is a small part of the work to be done for the salvation of souls. Now, this is why I mentioned over and over again, it's not just preaching. 
I appreciate, as you hear me saying over and over again, I appreciate the opportunity to come to you online. I appreciate that. Okay? But in the whole scope of things, preaching is a small part of the work to be done for the salvation of souls. Yes, it's what is it? It is going into the homes. It's visiting with people in their homes. You know, take, uh, taking concern for young people. You know, I had the greatest joy of my life. One of my greatest joys happened just yesterday. Just yesterday was absolutely amazing. There was a young girl in church, and, uh, you know, I've known her since she was born practically. I used to talk to her and encourage her and whatnot. And then, you know, yesterday, you know, I was visiting the family and I was leaving. She wasn't there with the family, and she comes to me right afterwards and knocks on my car window, and she says, can you give me studies for baptism? And that is absolutely amazing. You know, that's what we're living for. That's what we need to be doing is caring so that young people can actually come to us and talk to us. Not to have a bird barrier there between us. We need, are we caring for them? This is why it says here, preaching is a small part of the work to be done for the salvation of souls. God's Spirit convicts sinners of the truth and He places them in the arms of the church. The ministers may do their part, but they can never perform the work that the church should do. God requires His church to nurse those who are young in faith and experience, to go to them, not for the purpose of gossiping with them, but to pray, to speak unto them words that are like apples of gold in pictures of silver. That's our work, brethren. And not only ministers, obviously this here brings it out to the entire church. The entire church should be fathers and mothers nursing those young in the faith. When a worker gives Bible studies to somebody and they're baptized and they're brought into the church, now it's for the church members to nurse them rather than just to gossip with them or something of that nature. That's the work that God has for us. And why is it that so few of them are doing that in the church? Why is it that this work is neglected? Volume 2, page 280. I saw the great lack of nursing fathers and mothers in Israel. And I saw why there are not more is because they will not take the burden and fill the place which God would be pleased to have them occupy. Self must be denied in order to fill this place. Earnest prayer and faithful watch care for others will take the place of ease and indifference. And often worldly interests will suffer a little. They may have to visit some brother or sister or some inquiring friend who needs help just when they wish to accomplish some worldly object. But they lose a little of the earthly treasure here and do their master's will, they will lay up treasure in heaven. Their master for their sakes became poor that they through his poverty might be made rich. Yes, we have work to do. You know, when I was living in Australia, it was so appreciative for me that I can call one of our brethren. He was a businessman. He's involved in business and well, he had a lot of work to do in his business. But when I call him up and say, hey, I need you to come visit me, visit with somebody with me, and he's ready to leave his work. You know, sometimes he has to adjust his time and I have to adjust mine, but he's ready to do that. We need more of these people. Why? Because it'll, yeah, it'll cost you something. But this is the work for the whole church. Turning the hearts of the fathers to the children is not just the work in the home. It's not just the work of leaders to the church members. It's the responsibility of every church member. And that's the work of Elijah. We've been studying about Elijah all this time, but this is the crux of the work. Are we prepared to do that? Even in church institutions, we need this. It's not just in, in uh, church environments, but even where we're having publishing houses or something like that, do we have fathers and mothers in Israel? Volume 8, 143 says, I have been shown that there is need of fathers and mothers in Israel being united with the institution. Devoted men and women should be employed who, because they are not continually pressed with cares and responsibilities, can look after the spiritual interests of the employees. 
Do we know that we have to care for the spiritual interests of employees? Yeah, the, we're here at the general conference offices over here. We have different employees. We have different ministers here. Do we know that these ministers need spiritual interest in them? We forget about all these things. What about the children of ministers? Do we know that they need care? It is not necessary that such men and women should be continually at work in missionary lines in this large institution. Not half is being done that should be done in this respect. It should be the part of these men and women to labor for the employees in spiritual lines, giving them instruction that will teach them how to win souls, showing them that this is to be done not by much talking, but by a const but by a consistent Christ-like life. The workers are exposed to worldly influences. But instead of being molded by these influences, they should be consecrated missionaries, controlled by an influence that elevates and refines. Thus they will learn how to meet unbelievers and how to exert an influence that will win them to Christ. The spiritual care that we have for one another, even in the workforce. Yeah, that's what we're talking about here. So how is this to be done in a practical way? How are we to be fathers and mothers in Israel? In Review and Herald 1888-6, it says, Will you now overcome the world in keeping close to the side of Jesus? Learn to bear his yoke and lift his burden? Where will there now be found in the church burden bearers? Not those who are trying to occupy the highest position, but those who are earnest, humble workers for Jesus. Fathers and mothers in Israel are everywhere needed. Those who will honor God in their families, in the church, and among unbelievers, and wherever they are. Think of different ones for whom you can manifest an interest. And in the fear of God, make personal efforts to reach them. Consider, oh, consider how many years you have occupied a place in the garden of the Lord and how little fruit you have borne. What would happen if every single one of us in the church started to think about those that we need to manifest an interest for? To pray and say, Lord, okay, uh, tell me how, how can I work for this? And right now we're talking about the work in Canada. Yes, the work in Canada can develop really well. It can develop beyond our imaginations. How? When every one of us start praying this prayer. Lord, who do you want me to take a personal interest in? And you know that by helping others overcome, you help yourself overcome? That's how it works. We help others by what? By helping others, we help ourselves. And that's what we need. So think of different ones for whom you can manifest a personal interest. Not just, okay, I'm here to give you a Bible study. But do you care for them? Do you care what's happening in their life? You know, it's not just, are you living up to the standards of the church? But what struggles are you going through that's maybe help making you have a difficult time with some of these standards? Are we concerned for them personally? You know, Jesus talked to a profligate woman. Look at that woman who had, uh, I don't know how many husbands she had. And Jesus didn't dare condemn her for that. He wanted, he was interested in her personally. What about the woman that was caught in the act of adultery? He didn't sit there and start telling her where she was wrong. She knew where she was wrong. What attracted to her to Jesus? It wasn't his repetition of the law. She can get that from the Pharisees. They can give you plenty of that. What was it that attracted her to Jesus? He cared for her personally. Do we care for people personally? That's the issue. That's what we need to have. And you know, when such an individual dies, yes, such a father in Israel, notice here in 2 Kings 13, verse 14. Now Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness, whereof he died. 
And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. When you die, does someone miss you as a father and a mother in Israel? That's what we need to have today. And when we're talking about the Elijah to come, when we're talking about the people preparing for the second coming of Christ as the Elijah, their work is to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Do you understand that you're a father to somebody? Do you know that? Are you a father and mother in Israel actually caring for the people in the church? In John chapter 21, verse 15, describes the work of ministry. There are different types of ministry, but the work of ministry. And the first responsibility of ministry, Jesus says in John 21, 15, so when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. He didn't say go feed the sheep. He said feed my lambs. That means become a father. Become a mother in Israel. And I plead for every one of us here as we are going through this conference and thinking about the work of Elijah that we may understand our responsibility as fathers and mothers in Israel. I want to close with volume 4, page 535. The steady progress of our work and our increased facilities are filling the hearts and minds of many of our people with satisfaction and pride, which we fear will take the place of the love of God in the soul. Busy activities in the mechanical part of even the work of God may so occupy the mind that prayer shall be neglected and self-importance and self-sufficiency so ready to urge their way shall take the place of true godliness, meekness, and lowliness of heart. The zealous cry may be heard, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. But where are the burden bearers? Where are the fathers and mothers in Israel? Where are they, brethren? Where are the fathers and mothers in Israel to not only to give the letter of the law, but to care for souls as they that must give an account? Where are they today? Where are those who carry upon the heart the burden for souls and who come in close sympathy with their fellow men, ready to place themselves in any position to save them from eternal ruin. That's what the church needs today. If we're talking about the second coming of Christ, one of the requirements is to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. And that means to become fathers and mothers in Israel. May the Lord help us experience a reformation like we've never seen before. And that throughout Canada, America, throughout the entire world, we as a people will be known for what? The Elijah people, not just standing on Mount Carmel, condemning the false prophets of Baal, but turning the hearts of the fathers to their children. May the Lord help us that that is the church that we will be known for and that that is the church preparing the way for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. What a powerful presentation. The Lord is so good. We have a mission to do with our children. And this is the next generation that will help to close the work. So we would like to now close with a, with a prayer for those that are able to kneel. 
our gracious, loving Father in heaven. We're so thankful to you that you have revealed to us the Elijah message for this time. Thank you for giving us the privilege that we can be this people, the Elijah people in these last days. Lord, help us to remember that the work of Elijah was not just at Mount Carmel. The work of Elijah was not just at Naboth's vineyard or in the palace of King Ahab. But that the majority of the work of Elijah was turning the hearts of the fathers to the children. Lord, help us to be that people. Help us to remember where we have failed. Where we have failed by giving the wrong example. Help us to care for souls. Those who have wandered from the fold, help us to care for them so they can come back home and realize that this is their place of protection. Lord, forgive us our sins. Forgive us of neglecting so much of our responsibilities and help us to make use of the shortness of this time that we can redeem the time and see many souls brought into your kingdom is our prayer in a Jesus-worthy name. Amen. Please stay tuned for the presentation tomorrow morning by Brother Paul Chapman from Australia. Until then, have a very good night.